So my name is Hussein Jurde, and uh, today I want to talk about progressive web patterns, um, specifically the purple pattern, what it is and how you can use it. So the purple pattern is not a specific tool or technology, but it's rather a methodology that you can use in order to make sure your applications load fast and load reliably. First and foremost, you can think of trying to push your most critical assets to your users, and you do this to try and render your initial route as soon as possible. You can then think of trying to pre-cache some or all your resources, as well as lazy load all of your remaining routes. Now, before we go into the techniques of how we can actually apply this pattern, I want to talk about mobile for a bit. I think it's safe to say that the vast majority of us in this room own a mobile device of some sort. Now, what we do on our mobile devices can vary day to day, but there's no denying that the amount of time we've been spending on our smartphones and tablets have only increased year after year after year. Comscore came out with a 2017 US mobile app report, and they found out that the average user spends 16 times more time on popular native apps than the mobile web. Now, as consumers, there's no denying that we're far more likely to spend more time on native applications than we are on the mobile browser. But with that being said, mobile web pages still received over twice as many unique monthly visits than native apps. And this is huge. This just goes to show that we spend a lot of time on the web, even on our mobile phones. So how can we make sure that users who experience our web pages and our applications have a great experience? regardless of what device they use. There are quite a few many ways, but we'll only go through a few in this talk. Now, before we do that, I want to talk about the web for a bit. When I open a browser on my mobile device, or any device, and I type something into the URL bar and press Enter, a request is made to a remote server somewhere. And after a certain period of time, the server responds with the content that my browser needs. Now, usually, this takes shape of an HTML document. The next thing the browser needs to do is actually parse the contents of the HTML file and find out what other resources that it needs. For each of those, it submits a request for them and gets a response for them as well. Now, this can be CSS for styling, it could be JavaScript for dynamic content, and it can also be static images, for example. Now, you can see with a typical web page, multiple round trips are usually needed in order to give all the content that the user needs to see. Let's say this is the HTML that was first retrieved on the initial request. We have a style sheet file and a JavaScript file as well. One thing we can do in order to help the fact that multiple round trips are made is to leverage something called preload. Now, preload has a syntax that a lot of us are familiar with. It's a link HTML tag with a rel attribute with the value of preload, an href attribute with the value of the location of our file, and an as attribute to define the type of file. Here, we're trying to preload a JavaScript file, so we've defined it as script. Now, what does preload actually do? Preload lets us tell the browser which resources are critical for the user. The browser will then know to try to download those resources as soon as possible without blocking the window on load event. You can use preload like we just did for resources defined at the head of your HTML but you're going to get the most bang for your buck using it for resources that are usually discovered much later. An example could be a font file tucked deep in one of your CSS files. You can use preload to preemptively fetch JavaScript, style sheets, and again, it's the as attribute that, that defines the type of file you're trying to load. You can even use preload for images, for fonts, for style, audio, video, and there's even more. Another useful hint that you can also use is something called prefetch. And prefetch works in a very similar way. The difference is prefetch is more so used to prioritize resources at a different navigation route. So the browser will try to download the resource as soon as possible, but it's going to first take care of all the resources it needs for the current page. So it might be straightforward to add link preload and prefetch tags to the head of your HTML if you're building a simple static site, but if you're using a module bundler, it's most likely a little more complex. Fortunately, if you are using Webpack, there's a plugin for it, and it's built by Adi Osmani from the Chrome team. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to add preload and prefetch hints for some or all your major chunks or bundles. 
And you can do this with just adding a few configuration lines in your Webpack config file. So can we use preload right now? Fortunately, Chrome, Firefox, Opera, and Safari all support preload. With Edge, it's currently under development. So another important point of topic that I also want to talk about now is something called HTTP2 server push. Now, HTTP2 aims to provide a number of performance improvements over HTTP1. But the only one we're going to focus on in this talk is just server push. The idea behind server push is when the browser makes the initial request to get that first index HTML file, we can have the server push down critical assets at the exact same time. In other words, we could tell the server to push assets down the wire to the browser before the browser even knows it needs those files. This can be useful because we're cutting round trips to the server, so we can get faster load times. One thing I didn't mention earlier was instead of using link HTML tags, you can also use link HTTP headers in order to actually achieve preload. And the syntax is pretty much the same. You define the file, the rel preload attribute, and the as attribute. Now, what a lot of hosting platforms and services do is if they, they, already, if they already support H2 push and they see link HTTP headers, they'll automatically try pushing those assets down the wire. And an example of such is Firebase. There's a single Firebase JSON file where you can add your configuration settings if you're using hosting on Firebase, and you can add your link HTTP headers there. Firebase will then always try to push those assets down using server push, and this is so useful because we don't have to do any additional work. If you want to use link HTTP headers, but you only want to achieve preload and not worry about server push, you can just add a no push attribute. So here's some data um, from Jeremy Wagner. He wrote a very interesting guide to, to H2 push. And one thing that he did was he ran a number of tests on a single web page with slightly different variables and calculated page load times. The very largest bar you see over here is the load time when he has HTTP1 without any enhancements. To the right of that, you can see how page load time gets decreased when he inlines CSS. And to the far right, you can see what happens when he inlines everything. Now, we know inlining CSS and JavaScript is going to improve load times because the browser does not need to actually make the round trip to the server to get those files. But it's not always the most practical way of doing things. To the far left, you can see what happens when he just switches to HTTP2 and doesn't do anything else. And like I said, there's already a number of performance improvements besides server push, and you can see load times were actually decreased. To the right of that, you can see how it gets even lower when he pushes critical CSS. And to the right of that, you can see what happens when he pushes everything. And interestingly enough, you can see that load times actually increase when he pushes everything instead of just pushing critical CSS. And this brings me to my next point. With H2 push, you can end up pushing too much. There's no right number of files you should be pushing, and it always depends on the type of application you're building. But one thing about H2 push that's important to mention is that you're sort of telling the browser which resources to prioritize. So if you're not very careful, you might actually cause more harm than good. Another thing about H2 push is you can't H2 push is you can run into the problem of pushing unused assets. If you tell the server to push down a certain JavaScript file and your browser doesn't use that at all, you're going to just waste users' bandwidth. And another thing we should also talk about is the cache. If the browser's already cached a file into its memory or HTTP cache, the server has no idea about that. It's going to continue pushing that file or resource down the wire, and we're still going to waste bandwidth again. We'll talk about a potential solution to this in a bit. Now to switch gears, um, I think a lot of us are familiar um, with seeing this slide. Believe it or not, when I was practicing for this talk and I would see this, I thought my internet just died for some reason, that I realized I'm using Keynote, I don't need to stress. Um, but a lot of us see this when we try to load a web page on Chrome and we don't have a working network connection. And sometimes when we really don't have a working network connection for quite some time, we might even start playing the game. Um, but one thing we can actually leverage to prevent us from seeing this is something called service workers. Now, a service worker is a script that runs in the background of your browser when you view a web page. You can either create the file and logic yourself, or you can use a library. One such library is called Workbox, and it's also built by the Google Chrome team. You can install the CLI globally, and there's a Workbox wizard command that will actually kickstart the process for you. Now, the API that I'm showing you here is actually for Workbox 3, and it's still in beta. So it might slightly change in the future, but the general structure will most likely be the same. 
So running Workbox Wizard, what that does is it actually starts a number of questions. They ask you a few questions that you have to answer. The very first one is, what is the root of your web app? If you're using a module bundler, you most likely have a final dist or build folder. The second question is, which file types would you like to pre-cache? You can say, I'd like to pre-cache all my file types, or I only want to be more selective and pre-cache stages JavaScript and PNG, and that's it. The third question is, where would you like your service worker file to be saved? You most likely want to save this in the final folder that gets deployed. And the last question is, where, where would you like to save these configuration options? If you pick the default answer of workboxconfig.js, what it does is it'll save your answers to these responses in a settings file of its own. So then it tells you you can run a workbox generate sw command with the location of that file. And now every time you run this, a new service worker file will be created. So we can create a workbox, we can create a service worker quite simply just running, just running the wizard process, but we still need to tell the browser how to register that file. And we can do that by adding a simple script tag in our index.html. The very first thing we can check for is say, hey, do service workers exist in my browser? Because not all browsers actually support service workers. If it does, we want to make sure that server, we register our service worker after window on load. And we do this because we don't want window on load to contend with service worker registration. After that, it's primarily just navigator service worker register with the location of your service worker file. And you can have console outputs if you like to say things are successful or something bad happened that's not working. So we've talked about how to create a service worker file. And we've talked about how to register it. We really haven't touched up on what exactly service workers do. So service workers act like a middleman between your browser and the network. When your service workers actually pre-cached assets, the next time you reload the page, the service worker will know to provide those assets to the browser instead of the browser having to make the trip to the server in entirely. So we're gonna, we can get much faster repeat visits. The very first thing we can think about in terms of actually trying to pre-cache is your application shell. And like the name suggests, your application shell is essentially the shell of your user interface. It's the header, the footer, the loading icons. It's the HTML, JavaScript, and CSS for everything that doesn't actually hold real living data. So remember how the very last question that Workbox asked us is, do you want to save these settings to the configurations file? This is how that file looks like. It's a simple exports object with just attributes that define our answers. Glob directory is essentially where the root of our app is. Glob patterns are just wildcards for the type of files you want to pre-cache, and SWDest is the destination of your service worker. So as useful as it is to use Workbox and run that command every single time we create it to create a new service worker, the problem there is every single time you make a change to our application, say we add an image or remove a file, we want to make sure the service workers are up to date. So instead of actually installing the CLI globally, what we can do is we can install it as a dev dependency and then integrate it right into our build process. So now every single time we run a build, we know we have a service worker that's up to date always being created. If you happen to be using Webpack or even Gulp, Workbox provides a known module as well as a Webpack plugin that you can use instead of the CLI. So the second thing service workers also can allow us to do is pre-cache the results for dynamic content. And if we go back into that settings file that we just were at previously, we can add a runtime caching array of objects. And each object can be different URL patterns. For example, here I'm saying your.api.com. When a request is made to this API, cache the results of the response. And then there's a handler attribute that actually defines your network strategy. Network first essentially means always return the results from the network and pre-cache the new results to the service worker. But if the network happens to fail, then show me the results of my service worker. So the user can actually see older data instead of no data if they don't have a working network connection. But network first is not the only network strategy. There's also the cache first strategy, which works in sort of the opposite way. And here, I only want results from my service worker cache, and if that fails, then give me the results of the network. This might make more sense if you're trying to build your application with, and, and you know the data might not actually change. You just want the data to your user as fast as possible. There's also a stale while revalidate strategy. And the way this one works is a request is made to both the service worker and the network at the same time. Now, the service worker will most likely return its result faster so that you can, the user can see older data first. But once the network request has completed, the service worker information will actually update for the user or revalidate so the user can see actual data. 
or the latest data. There's a cache-only strategy where you want to actually only want to see results from the service worker, and if that fails, don't show anything at all. This might make more sense if you're building your application where you know there might not be a network connection and you only want to test offline um, responses. And there's a network-only strategy where you only get results from the network, and if that fails, don't show anything at all. That is most likely going to be more useful if you're build, having some more fine-grained control over certain APIs where you don't want, for example, sensitive information from the cache to show, or maybe stale data doesn't make any sense and you can only show the latest data. So the Workbox wizard can actually make creating a service worker file really easy. You don't actually need to write any logic yourself. You just answer a series of questions, and you can have a new file generated on a build process every single time. But sometimes you might actually already have an existing service worker. Um, or you might want to make use of other service worker functionality like background sync or web push notifications. Or you might just have more complex requirements in terms of pre-caching and routing. And what you can do there instead is actually add an inject manifest flag. And what this allows you to do is it allows you to then dive into your service worker and actually start importing things from Workbox where you like to. So again, service workers allow for two things. They allow us to pre-cache the resources that make up our app shell, as well as dynamic content. And the combination allows for offline support and faster repeat visits. So can we use service workers right now? Chrome, the latest version of Safari, Firefox, and Opera are all supporting service workers. Edge, it is currently under development, but it is in preview mode right now. And this is huge, because we know pretty soon that all major browsers will be supporting service workers. So remember how previously I talked about H2 push and how it's not cache aware, and that could be a problem? So the thing is, if you have a service worker, it might actually help solve that problem. So let's revisit our original scenario again. If I open a page that has H2 push enabled, and I try navigating to its initial route, and the critical resources or resources comes to the user um, straight being pushed from the server, I can get a fast first page load. But I can also have my service worker pre-cache those assets. And now the service worker will pre-cache that in a separate cache than the browser's memory cache. So now when I reload the web page, I can have the service worker serve those assets instead of the browser having to go all the way to the network and make a server push when it doesn't need to. So you can potentially get the best of both worlds. And now to switch gears one more time, I want to talk about bundles for a bit. I think a lot of us here who do front-end development, um, I think we rely on a lot of JavaScript libraries and frameworks, and they've allowed us to do a lot more on the client side than we could have done before. But sometimes it comes a bit of a cost. Um, somebody was nice enough to actually generate Hello World outputs for a number of different JavaScript libraries, um, and what he noticed was some actually had four kilobytes, gzipped, while others actually served output bundles of up to 200 kilobytes. Now, there are different reasons why different frameworks um, have different output bundle sizes from the very beginning, but the idea here is that if you're building functionality into your JavaScript app and you're adding more and more client-side logic, your bundle size can grow and grow. One thing we can do in order to help this fact is to do something called code splitting. And the idea behind code splitting is instead of serving the entire bundle to your user at the initial route, why not give them what they need and only give them everything else when they need it when they actually navigate to that part of the application? This concept is also called lazy loading. If you're building something in Angular, lazy loading is actually built into the routing framework. When you define your paths, you can actually define a load children attribute and then connect that with a separate module. Now, Angular will know to not load the JavaScript that makes up that module until the user reaches that route. If you're, building re if you're building things with React, you can make use of a library called React Loadable, and it's built by James Kyle. And what this allows you to do is not only, not only code split based on route, you can actually asynchronously import based on component level. And it can give you even more fine-grained control. Say you have an application with tabs, and you switch the tab, and you don't want that component to, to actually you know, serve as JavaScript bundle only unless it's switched to, St React Loadable can help there. So now, if you're doing code splitting and lazy loading, it's probably, a good idea to keep in your, it's probably a good idea to keep an eye on your bundle size. And there's a lot of different tools out there that you can actually use. One such tool is called Webpack Bundle Analyzer, and it gives you a nice visualization of how different parts of your bundle are larger and smaller than other parts. So when it comes to load times, um, there are two pretty important metrics you should think about when you're building a web application. The very first one being first meaningful paint. 
And this is essentially the time it takes for your user to see meaningful content on their device. The second one is time to interactive. And this is when the JavaScript thread settles and your user can actually interact with your application. Now, I've seen a lot of different statistics for time to interactive for different devices. And I think as developers, a lot of us have become accustomed to building our applications with healthy network connections and powerful MacBook or desktop machines. Um, we sometimes don't think about users who use our apps with lower-end connections and lower-end devices. So one statistic that I saw about the average time to interactive for a web page on a lower-end mobile device for an emerging markets connection is 16 seconds. I think I saw somewhere else say it's 19 seconds. And the more, the more I see these numbers, the crazier it gets. But it's just important to realize that if your application takes longer than five seconds to load, chances are your user might give up. I hope you enjoyed this talk as much as I enjoyed giving it. My name is Hussein Jirde. Thank you.